Good morning, church. I want to share a scripture with you. Matthew chapter 21. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and the others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Let's pray together. O oh, Father, as we comprehend the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, on this Palm Sunday, as we recall the details of this moment in time, may it transfer to the moment that we now dwell in, that we might apply the lessons learned from ancient history to today. What happened the day you rode into Jerusalem? What does that mean for us today? What was accomplished on the moment you rode into Jerusalem? How does that affect us? These are the mysteries that we aim to search out in your word. How the king of all kings rode into his own city, humble, was this foretold before it began? If so, what does it mean? And what does it mean that when you entered the temple, you corrected the atmosphere of worship in the temple to be accurate? As we aim to discern these truths, we ask for your help, Holy Spirit. We welcome your presence into this time, for we know that you dwell within us. So wherever we are, Holy Spirit, you are present. Would you train us and teach us? Would you remind us what it means that the house of God should be a house of prayer? What does that mean for us? What does it mean that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Should we in and of ourselves be houses of prayer? What does this all mean? Only you, Holy Spirit, can grant us divine discernment. And it is this that we ask, that you would lead us through the text again. Show us again 
the riding into Jerusalem. Show us again what Palm Sunday truly stands for and what we can apply to our lives today as we recall the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. And wherever you are, you can agree by saying, Amen. And amen. I do welcome you to another time together in the Holy Word of the Lord. It is Holy Week in the church calendar. We begin on Palm Sunday. This story of Matthew 21, recorded in all four Gospels, of Jesus coming into Jerusalem is a crucial pivotal moment in the ministry of Jesus in his 33 years on the earth. It is crucial that we understand not just that palm branches are passed out among the gathered in the sanctuary, but what does it actually mean that they laid palm branches down before Jesus? What does it mean that Jesus rode in on a colt? Why is that important? Why is it important that we understand where Jesus went when he did come into Jerusalem and why he went into the temple and what he did when he went into the temple? These elements of this particular story are crucial that we fully understand the relevance and the importance, the priority of this monumental moment in history. It is on the church's calendar to be remembered for reason. We will come into Good Friday, where we will recall the death of our King on our behalf. We will celebrate the risen Savior on Easter Sunday and rejoice that our King is alive and has defeated death in the grave. But we cannot forget what led up to those pivotal events, and that is the riding into Jerusalem exactly as God intended for this all to transpire. So let's begin by working our way through the text in Matthew chapter 21. It begins with the cult. We do not at this time have the cult. The cult needs to be um, possessed. And this is how that transpires. If you go to verse 1 of Matthew 21, it says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This beginning statement is not too unreasonable, though it has been originally taught as being some sort of miraculous. And there is a, a supernatural element to what just happened, and that is that Jesus knew there would be a cult uh, with its mother next to it. He knew exactly where it would be. This is not something pre-set up. He knew that this existed because it was foretold that it would exist. However, the idea that the person owning the cult gives up the cult to the two disciples is not as unreasonable as you might think, and that is because of what Jesus told the disciples to say to the owner of the cult and to the neighbors that saw the cult being taken by the two disciples. The statement was, the Lord needs them. We must understand that in that day and in that time, if the king was going to ride in, if the master, if the sovereign was going to ride into a community, he would need to ride either on his steed or he would ride on a colt. The steed or the horse was not to be ridden by anyone but the king. It was the king's horse. Same goes for the colt. It was not to be ridden by anyone else except the king. It was the king's colt. It was to symbolize coming in peace. 
So what we need to understand is when Jesus gives this directive to the disciples, go in and say that the Lord needs them. It was commonplace that if the Lord commandeers any other thing that you own, you are to give it in to the king. So by Jesus giving this instruction, he is inferring in and of himself that he is Lord. The Lord needs them. So when the people let go, and we see in other gospels more description of what happened to the owner, what happened to the neighbors as they watch the two disciples come in and take the colt. It is important that we recognize the history and why this is important that Jesus has spoken of himself now as a sovereign and is receiving the colt as only a king would and then he'll ride in on a unridden colt. These are crucial pieces, including even the idea that they put their, their cloaks on as they would for a king. It also says in one of the Gospels that they placed him on the colt. This, again, is a way of showing his supremacy. Uh, he doesn't climb onto the colt himself. He is placed on, just like the king is placed on his steed or his horse. So these are hidden statements that are within the story that if we understand the culture, we get the more clear picture of what's actually going on. So the idea that the Lord needs them, this makes more sense if we understand that particular culture. If we go to verse 4, Matthew 21, it says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And then we see in verse 6 and 7, the disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on their cloaks, and he sat on them. So we see here that this was prophesied. This was spoken by God through the prophet Zechariah. The cult prophecy is over 500 years earlier. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 is the original prophecy. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It was prophesied, meaning God spoke through the prophet to the people. This is how the prince, the king, will come in to Jerusalem. Look for it. Watch for this to happen. However, if you want to go even farther into history, you can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 49. This is the first place where we hear of the Lion of Judah, the first prophecy given of the Lion of Judah. In that same chapter, Genesis 49, we see that it talks about the king will come on a colt. So it's helpful for us to recognize that this was God's original plan all along. 500 years earlier, God said through the prophet Zechariah, this is what to watch for. This is how you know that the king has come into Jerusalem. However, there's actually two prophecies. We focus primarily on the one prophecy here mentioned in Matthew that talks about, and we see written in verse 4, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. But we have another prophecy that is transpiring right at this same time. This prophecy we see written out in Luke chapter 19, verse 41 and 42, where it says, when he drew near and he saw the city, this is while he's still up on the Mount of Olives, he wept over it. When Jesus, prior to coming down the hill and into the valley and then up through the gate into Jerusalem, before that happened, while waiting, for the cold, it says that he wept over the city, and it says that he mentions, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. 
while Jesus awaits the colt before the celebration begins and he sees Jerusalem in the distance while on the Mount of Olives, he weeps and he says, would that you, even you, had known on this day that makes for peace. Now, we already, we already understand now that coming in on a cult on the, is an idea of coming in peace. That's when the king comes this way. Now, if you recall, when Jesus comes again, he comes as king, it says he'll be riding on a white horse. He is not coming in peace. He's coming to judge the world. So we see him come into Jerusalem here on a donkey representing peace. And so we see that Jesus says, you don't understand what you're missing that's supposed to happen on this day, on the day I ride into Jerusalem. What is it that they're missing? Why would he weep and say, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. Because, again, over 500 years earlier, there was another prophecy. This prophecy came through Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is given a direct quote from the heavenlies, of when the Messiah would come. They call him the Prince. When will the Prince come? And there are numbers given of weeks and years. And Daniel writes all of this algorithm down and gives it to those that he is training. Daniel was an overseer of many. Uh, eventually known as the Magi. These are the ones that came to anoint Jesus as king after he was born. They were under the direct um, governance of Daniel. Daniel is the one that would have told them and primed them of what to look for. But Daniel receives this prophetic vision and speaking from God about when the timing of the prince coming into Jerusalem would be. Now, if you were to go to Daniel 9, you would see this list of numbers. And what we do understand is when we tabulate all those numbers together, we get 483 years. But it's interesting, there is a, a time that the 483 years is supposed to begin. In other words, Daniel receives this vision and he writes it down that says this is when the king will come. This is when the prince will come into the city. But don't start counting until this particular event happens. So Daniel receives this number and then he has to wait for an event to transpire. And once the event transpires, he starts the clock and counts out exactly how many days until the prince will arrive. This is how detailed God is. What they're waiting for is when Longjamanus decrees to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. When Longjamanus decrees to rebuild the city, when he stands up and says, now we will rebuild the city, it is at that point in time that we start the clock on Daniel's vision. Now we know it's 483 years, and we know exactly when Long Germanus made the decree to rebuild the city, and it's on March 14th, 445 BC. That's in Nehemiah chapter two, when we read of Long Germanus making the decree to rebuild the city was on March 14, 445 B.C. What we know is now on March 14, 445 B.C., to start the clock of Daniel's vision of 483 years. 
And if we were to count from the moment that Long Jemanus said, let's rebuild the city of Jerusalem and start the clock of 483 years, the prince is going to ride into Jerusalem as its king at the end of that 483 years. Well, we can thank someone by the name of Sir Robert Anderson, who computated 483 years for us, making sure to use the proper calendars. We're a different calendar than we are on now, the Babylonian calendar of only 360 days a year. He also included all the leap years and all the details that needed to be computated. And what he came up with was 173,000 880 days. According to that particular calendar of 483 years, he comes out at 173,880 days. Now, why is all of this important? Why are all these numbers from Daniel or the decree from Long Germanus and Nehemiah and all these big numbers, why are they important? They're important because it shows us that God is in complete control. And though we are hundreds of years in the past, God gave clear detail to be watchful that he would send his son into the city. The prince would come. So let's do the final piece of math. The final piece is... If we go from 445 B.C., March 14th, that's when Longimanus made the decree to say, let's rebuild Jerusalem. If we count out 173,880 days, it takes us to April 6th, 32 A.D. On April 6th, 32 A.D., that is the exact day that Jesus mounted a colt and rode into Jerusalem. Is God into the details? So much so, this is why Jesus wept when he saw the city and said, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. I told you I was coming on this day day, but it's been hidden from your eyes. It is crucial that we recognize that Palm Sunday was the plan all along. That though Jesus always walked from town to village, here he rides on a colt, not on accident, not because he's tired, but because it is a symbol. It is prophesied. It is the fulfillment of his kingship. Now we see, if we go back to Matthew 21, what happened when he rode into this city. And it says in verse 8, Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, the first thing we need to do before we talk about why they were saying the word Hosanna and what that actually means, why they were putting their cloaks on the ground, why they were using palm branches, and what any of that means. Let's back up and see how and why and what created this crowd, this parade of spectators. Jesus has been to Jerusalem multiple times before. There were no crowds of parading people casting their garments on the ground or laying branches before him. What is different? What is the catalyst that sparked this parade of praise? We need to look and remember what happened right before we get to the top of the Mount of Olives. It's known as the stimulus of Lazarus. 
Right on the opposite side of the Mount of Olives is where Lazarus lived. And if you remember what happened with Lazarus, Lazarus died. Lazarus was a very well-known person, respected by many. When Lazarus died, Jesus came and was heartbroken. It says that Jesus even wept. But Jesus also, though he had been in the tomb for over three days, four days, that Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb and they didn't even want to bring Lazarus out of the tomb because they knew that Lazarus had already begun to decompose. This is beyond anything they've ever seen before, that a decomposed body would be brought back out of a stone tomb. But they did. They rolled the stone back out of the way. They brought Lazarus out. Lazarus came walking out on his own strength. Lazarus is alive. It is the most supernatural thing that people have seen in the ministry of Jesus. Now, Jesus had raised the dead before, but not one that had been in the grave for this long. This was an extremely public event, for many people had come to mourn the loss of Lazarus. Jesus, in this moment, is so celebrated that there is such a anticipation of who he might be. You see here they say he's a prophet. People are still trying to figure out who he is. But notice that they're beginning to claim him as king. He's the son of David. He is, he is the prophesied one. It's beginning to make connections. He has supernatural ability to call those that had been dead for so long out of the grave. The decomposed body comes back into complete order. So the entire community from Jerusalem to Bethpage is, is in an uproar, so much so that even the Pharisees are saying, we need to go and kill Lazarus again to calm down the uproar. We need to arrest Jesus. We're losing the people. They're all going after Jesus. This is the the hype of what is going on. So now we can understand a little bit more why there was such a parade of praise going into Jerusalem. We see some of this in John chapter 12, verse 17 and 18, that says, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So now we can understand a little bit more clearly why there was such a parade of praise as he rides into Jerusalem. Let's take a look at the cloaks and the palms just for a moment. Why were people putting their cloaks, their coverings, their jackets on the ground? This is a symbol of he is the king. We first see this in 2 Kings chapter 9 when Jehu was anointed as king. It says that when he came out of his house, they had laid all their coats on the ground and he walked on their coats to symbolize he is, he is king now. That's partially where we see this. It's also the humility of the people being able to lay their garment for the king to, to ride on to show that we submit to his divine authority. The palm branches, they have even more of a meaning than the cloaks do, and we see the palm branches, they symbolized victory. They were often used as symbols of victory. They would wave them for victorious celebrations. We begin to see this in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40, that says, you shall take on the first day the fruit of the splendid tree, branches of the palm trees and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. This was part of their tradition at the time. But we see palm branches even in heaven. It says that we will have them. Revelation 7, 9, after this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, 
from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Again, it symbolizes victory. What we need to begin to recognize is what's going on in the minds of the people while Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. The, cl the cloak is off and on the ground, symbolizing we recognize you as the son of David, the rightful heir to the throne, the Jewish throne, king. And they're using palm branches, symbolizing victory. And now we need to take a look at the word that they're saying, because the word that they're saying, they actually didn't make up in that moment. This wasn't a spontaneous song. It's from Psalm 118, and they're reading or they're singing from verse 25 to 26. Hosanna in the highest. Now, in the King James, it actually says, Save us, we pray, O Lord, O Lord. We pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Hosanna, the very word Hosanna means save us. It's why it's translated that way uh, in the King James. Save us, we pray. So what they're actually saying is they see him as their rightful king, the king of the Jews, and they have palm branches symbolizing victory, and they're saying, save us. Go into the temple and save us. It is different than just merely praise. It was a declaration that Jesus was going to be not just the king, but the prophesied king to overthrow Rome. And this was why when you begin to look back at the disciples and how the disciples constantly were asking Jesus, now will you take your rightful place as king? Now can we go in and fight off the enemy? When we get to Jerusalem, can we fight off the enemy and take your rightful place? Hey, when you become the king, can we sit at your right hand and your left hand? Hey, when, when we take over each one of the disciples kept coming forward with this idea that Jesus was going to rule and reign from Jerusalem as king, like David did. They've been waiting, the Jewish people have been waiting for the Davidic Messiah to go back to those heydays when the Jewish people reigned. There was plenty. There was, there was a... God-fearing king on the throne. This is what everyone is expecting. Now we understand a little bit more why it says they were shouting Hosanna, Matthew 21, 9. Shouting, this was a loud thing. This was not a, a, a finished, uh, trained choir or some sort of beautiful, eloquent song. This was a shouting of victory and a save us, go in and save us, our Davidic Messiah. Even the Pharisees at one point, while Jesus is riding in, catch up with him in Luke 19, 39 and 40. And it says that they said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. They said that because everyone was loud. There was volume with this save us Hosanna statement, and Jesus responds, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Jesus was not going to hush the people. We are riding into the great city of Jerusalem. They are seeing him as a conquering Messiah. This is the anticipation of the people. However, verse 12 ruins everything for all the celebratory pomp 
all the excitement, all the chanting that he is the son of David is almost instantly silenced by verse 12. Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Why is that Why is that such a bad thing? We need to understand a bit of the real estate and we need to understand the expectation of the people and the action of Jesus. The real estate is that when you come to the particular entrance on this side of the Jerusalem gate, there are two ways for you to go when you come in through the gate. If you are to go to the left, you go down to where the people worship. You go down to where the temple is. If you turn to the right, however, this is where the Roman guard is. This is where all the leading officials are. This is where the government is seated. This is where all the political figures are over to the right that oversee what's going on in the temple. Now, if you picture, again, the expectation of the people, save us, Hosanna, do, do the thing that we see that you should do, God. Go in and take over. Then we would obviously see that when he opens and when the door is already open, but he goes into the, the walled city, he would turn to the right and begin to go up to take care of the authoritative business, the politics, the victory that everybody was anticipating. But Jesus didn't turn to the right. It says here, Jesus entered the temple, which means that Jesus turned to the left. And if Jesus turned to the left, this means that he went down into the temple area and then he does make a ruckus, but he does it against his own people. It is the Jewish people who are sitting here at the money tables. And instead of going after the Roman guard, instead of going after the political figures, he went after his own and says, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Now we, we can go back and see, and we, we know for a fact that several times we have documented cases where they were purposely using extremely high interest rates for the temple exchange. All that that means is when you would come to the temple, you had to exchange your money for money that could be used in the temple. And they had such a high exchange rate that those that were working the money tables were becoming extremely wealthy by uh, charging too much for the temple currency. They were hurting people financially and keeping them from making the offering that they wanted and selfishly gaining from it. We also know that this was happening by people bringing in their own offerings, their own lambs and pigeons, and they had to be approved. But they were saying that none of the animals brought in, and most of the animals brought in from the outside, there was some blemish and they could not be used. So you had to purchase an animal that was approved already. And those, again, made the profits for the spiritual overseers. They were making a fortune off of the worship of God. And instead of Jesus going in and dealing with the political figures, he went into the church and he 
corrects the church. And he corrects the church in an extreme way. He entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and those at the seats of those who sold pigeons. It was ferocious. It wasn't a discussion. It was ferocious. And what we must understand is this is bookending the ministry of Jesus because this is one of the last things we ever see Jesus do before he is arrested and tried and eventually crucified. This is one of the last things that Jesus ever does in the temple. And it's interesting because this sounds very much like the very first thing that Jesus ever did in the temple. If you go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 2, this is the very first thing Jesus ever did after being baptized, coming out of the wilderness in the 40 days of fasting, he comes on John chapter 2, verse 13, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple. He found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me, which is Psalm 69 verse nine. What is Jesus insanely passionate about but his house? Notice that the very first thing he did was to go into his father's house and to tell them what they were doing was inappropriate and wrong in such a dramatic fashion. To fashion a whip, to tip over the tables, to cascade the money onto the floor, to raise his voice and to, to make clear that this was inappropriate. And he defends his father's house. This is the first thing he did, and now it's the very last thing he did. He, instead of going up to a political move that everyone was chanting for, save us, redeem us from these people, he goes into the temple and he is concerned about his father's house. This is the story behind the story of Palm Sunday. That when he rode into Jerusalem, he went into the temple to clean it. Do we have that kind of thinking about Palm Sunday that God cares deeply about his house and that the worship and the way that we worship is a priority to him? And that this is not your house to get what you want from it so that you can come here and you can be filled and you can be pleasured by what you so want to hear, sing, or say. This house is the king's house and he is clearly defensive about what happens within its walls. We can take this a step farther to remind each other that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and that God cares how we treat the temple of the Holy Spirit. His dwelling place is important to him. So we can look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1, that says that we should guard our steps when we go into the house of God. Draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. Coming to the house of God. Remember, the church is not a structure. We, the children of God, are the church. But if we set aside a place to gather, 
how we gather, how we live, and how we worship is incredibly high on God's priority list. It is not up to our own preferences. What do we like? What do we desire? How do we want it to look, sound, feel? When he came into Jerusalem, he did not turn to the right. He turned to the left. And when he did so, he rebuked his own people. Now you can begin to see how quickly this people, who thought he would go in and have a revolution and would change everything because that's what they wanted, he would go in and politically take over and that they would reign supreme and he didn't do what they wanted, he did what needed to be done which was to correct on how we worship God. That we do so correctly in the way that he preordained for us to worship. Since when is worship all about what we can receive out of it and not what God has required from us? Worship literally in its definition in all the original languages of scripture, ancient Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, it means to get low to bow down, where we kiss the hand of the one to whom we worship. They turned his house into a house of profit. What have we turned his house into? A house of tradition? A social club? A place where we try not to offend anyone, so we read the Bible with scissors in our hands, cutting out the areas that we don't like or we feel cause offense. Embracing things that we know we ought not to embrace. Turning the halls of the sanctuary into concert venues instead of places of melody, for the divine, guard your steps. His house is to be a house of prayer. He does say, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer. Where is that written? Let's make sure we, we know where that is. Isaiah 56, verse seven, I will bring to my holy mountain and he mentions a house of prayer. But what we might miss is this. If you read Isaiah 56, which is what Jesus is quoting, verse seven, it says, I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Isn't it interesting how when we think of the seriousness of the house of God, it naturally becomes this somber thought that the house of God must be a somber place. He didn't say that. Somber and serious are two different things. To take serious the house of God is accurate. To make it a place that is only a somber dwelling where we must sit in silence. This is not anywhere in the biblical text. He says, it's a joyful house. Can we make a joyful noise unto the Lord and still make sure that God receives the credit and all the praise and all the adoration from his house. Can Palm Sunday be a joyful day in the church, yet God is the one receiving all the praise? Can we joyfully pray? Can we pray with joy, speaking to God who he is, what he's done, how he's watched over us, how he's cared for us, how he's led us through the seasons of life, how he has not left us, how he's still with us to this very day. Can there be joy in your prayer? 
Can there be joy in the house of God, yet recognize the severity of what we do in God's house he cares about? So we cannot come in flippantly into the house of God or casually into the house of God as to do what we want, how we want, pushing our own agenda and our own thinking. We come in and we do as the king has already preordained, yet we do so joyfully. Can prayer, seriousness, and joy link together in our understanding of the house of God. Jesus is not full of joy right now as he corrects the people about his house. He's upset because it was wrong what they did. But as he corrects, he says a statement, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Prayer belongs in God's house. Not an agenda, not a concert, definitely not a place to make a profit. Prayer, a talking with God, a communing with God. There are four main pillars of the house of God in the gathering of the church. One, that we worship him in his house. Two, that we teach the word of God as it is written in his house. Three, that we pray in his house. And four, is that we fellowship with one another in his house. On Palm Sunday, when Jesus rides into Jerusalem. He was saddened that they weren't expecting him. He was, in their mind, coronated as their king by their song of Hosanna, known as the Song of Ascent. But his priority that day was with no government official but with getting his father's house healthy again. Psalm 122, verse 1 says, that I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. If God prioritizes his house, so much so that on either end of his ministry here on earth, he worked on his house, cleaning it, making it accurate. Don't you think that you should prioritize the house of God as well? You should be glad to go, as Psalm 122 says. You should be glad to go to the house of the Lord. If you're unable to make it to the house of the Lord, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God dwells within you, but do your best to make sure you still connect with those that are the family of God. Make sure you still are a person that worships your king and make sure you are a person that talks to your God. Pray often. But for those of us that can, we should be glad to go to the house of the Lord, but we should be quick to make sure that what we do in the Father's house is pleasing to the Father before it resonates with us. Father, we thank you that you saw all of this beforehand. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus ever rode into Jerusalem, you You knew that this day would come. You knew how it would come. And so you spoke to the prophets so that they could speak to us and they could write it down to say, prepare yourself. This is exactly when the king will come through Daniel. This is how the king will come through Zechariah. Look for the king riding on a colt. 
But then, Father, thank you for reminding us that as he rode into Jerusalem, he went into the temple to correct what we had made incorrect. And to this day, we thank you for the ongoing correction about how we are to worship, how we are to pray in your house. Thank you, God, that you continue to teach us and train us until we see you face to face. And now as we seal this time on Palm Sunday, spending time again looking at this triumphal entry into Jerusalem, would you today hear our prayer, the prayer that you taught us right outside of Jerusalem, Sitting on a hill, you said, when you pray, pray like this. And we all join together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen well, happy palm sunday everyone until we meet again.